Steve, uh, this is Paul. I yell this to Steve. He, he plays, uh, he plays an awful lot too, bro. He so I thought about Cross Creek. He said it's super important. Oh, was it called something else? Was it called Temecula or Temecula Creek? That's what it was called. This is another guy I play with on Fridays. He's that's the master. <laughs> mm. Horrible. Brucey, what's up? Michael, what's up? Try tip. Gotta fix this. Oh, you did? <laughs> Good. I like that. Really? Good. Because he was going to come back and let me know, man. I would have called the leaders out. Right? That's what an armor bear does, man. Caesar, what's going on, brother? Jimmy, God bless you. Cousin Manny, what's up, cousin? What's up, Vinny? How you doing, bro? Gosh, this thing makes me look like 50 pounds heavier, man. What's up, Caesar? Good morning, Mike. Ricardo, good morning, brother. God bless you. Yes, Michael, praying for your wife. Praying for your wife, brother. Keep me posted, please. They're still making their burritos, man. I know I need to get out there, Caesar. All these guys think I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to the screen. All right, you guys, let's get started. Want to say good morning. Uh, I didn't get fired. Actually, uh, Bobby filled in for me last week. We had a, a prayer meeting that we went to uh, that Kirk Cameron was the speaker. So it was uh, out at the, in Chino Hills. So it was uh, Dave Bustamante, Pastor David and myself went out there and, and so uh, Bobby came and, and did, a, and I understand he did a great job. And when uh, I heard that when you did okay? It was only okay? <laughs> I heard that there was a, uh, that when uh, Bobby left, that uh, the spirit came down and licked up all the fire, all the water with flames around the altar. <laughs> and so thank you, Bobby. Thank you for filling in. Amen. <laughs> then we have our tickets for the men's conference. Andy will be here after our Bible study. Uh, for anybody who wants to pick up tickets, the bundle package is now done. Uh, the 16th was the last day, so but they will have tickets for the meal and the conference and a T-shirt if you want to buy one. Uh, also, wanna, uh, we have a guest with us, Darren. And so uh, he came, Bobby was able to pick him up. And so Darren, welcome. And he, this is his first time here, and he was already folding burritos. And so he fit right in. <laughs> and Jack for helping us out, thank you. And for the guys that got here this morning early, uh, to make the burritos. Thank you guys. And so I really appreciate that. So let's pray, you guys. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can come together as brothers in the Lord and worship you and honor you. Lord, there may be some of us here today that are going through rough waters. And Lord, may we be those men that are able to lay them at your feet. And Lord, to to even the things that may be plaguing our minds this morning, that we may sit those aside just for a moment to hear what the Spirit wants to tell us. So, Lord, we love you, and we thank you again for this place that we're able to worship you. Thank you for these men that are here, those who are watching online. Thank you for their faithfulness. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give a shout-out to our brother Caesar, uh, who's watching from Ensenada. We had a group of guys go out there last week and, and minister to them, and... 
it's really a blessing, right, Ray, where it, I don't know if Caesar and those guys know that, but you really minister to us. And, uh, and yeah, I need to get out there for those tacos, Caesar. Those are bomb. And so, okay, today you guys were in 1 Kings chapter 9. 1 Kings chapter 9. And we're going to be looking at verses, what's going on, Jim? Verses 1 through 9. And, uh, and, you know, this is an interesting study, you guys, because I want to ask you guys the question before we start. What can go wrong? <laughs> right? Glad, I'm, glad I asked. We think about our Christian life and we think about what it takes and how we endure as men to, uh, to live the Christian life. And a little bit, we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like. We, we throw the language around as Christians as we refer to it as our walk with the Lord. And a lot of times we can be in a place where things are going well. But then we could hit that spot in our walk where are things really going well? And so that question is something I want us to think about throughout the study. And, uh, and as we go through verses 1 through 9, I want to start off with the first five verses and then give us a recap and, and then get into our study. So when we look at 1 Kings chapter 9, starting with verse, verse 1, and it came to pass. When Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord, the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him in Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house, which you have built to put my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my command statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. What's interesting up to this point is if I give you guys a little bit of a recap from chapter 8, we see that the chapter 8 started after the temple has been built. And remember, it was one of these things where Solomon was able to build this temple that was promised to King David, his father. David was not able to build the temple. Why? Because he had blood on his hands. So the promise in 1 Samuel that this would be taken, would be promised is now being fulfilled. And Solomon took great care and detailed in building this temple. Not only was the temple built, but the house of Solomon was built, which included administrative offices. It included all the offices were judgment, a palace. And so the details of this, this, this house was, was very, very amazing. And then we see that eventually that the ark was now brought into the temple. And, and you see that Solomon begins to praise the Lord. The presence of the Lord was then in the temple where the ark of the covenant was brought back. And it said the priests couldn't even continue to do their work because the glory of God was so strong. And I thought that was interesting as us men, as, as do our lives represent God's presence, that it's effective to those around us. Then we see in, in, chap, in chapter 8, verses 12 to 21, that Solomon then praises the Lord for everything that had been done. And then there's a prayer of dedication. And then chapter 8 finishes with the dedication of the temple. And so now we are here in chapter 9. And we hear God's response to Solomon's building. The Lord had been silent this whole time during the work. We notice that there was no sign or no indication that God spoke to Solomon until after the temple was created, after the temple was built. And the Lord responds to Solomon. The question I want to ask you guys is, isn't our assurance in Jesus Christ a wonderful thing? You know, there's a confidence as Jesus Christ, our Savior, as he's given us peace that is beyond words. It's an assurance in God's forgiveness in our lives that gives us a clean yet humble conscience. It's a firm conviction that God's promises and having an ultimate hope in Jesus Christ. 
It's being unafraid of God's final judgment as Pastor David went through the great white throne judgment on Sunday. And we're certain about heaven. So what can possibly go wrong? You know, in the reign of Solomon, there were reasons for assurance like we're talking about that we have in Christ Jesus. Under the king, when you look at chapter 8, verse 24, you'll see that the people were at peace just as God promised. When you look at chapter 5, verse 5, the house that Solomon had built was for the name of the Lord. When you look at chapter 8, verse 14 and, and, and verse 55, it says that the temple represented the blessings that God would give to his people that they would be able to enjoy. It was a time when people knew that God had done as he promised. They rejoiced in God's kindness and goodness, goodness towards them. Sound like our walk today in the Lord, our assurance in, in Christ? So what can possibly go wrong? You know, oftentimes we can be in the same place spiritually, that we have a peace with God, that we have dedicated our lives to him, committed our lives to walking in the ways of the Lord, and we have made our lives and our bodies a temple, a living temple of the Holy Spirit. And we find ourselves in that good place where we have blessings from the Lord and we're walking in his promises and, and, and we have peace all around us. And we find ourselves in a good place. But this is a time where we have to be careful because we can become comfortable and idle. I don't know about you guys, but there's been times where I felt that I'm in a good place. And because I'm in a good place, I'm going to, and we can fill in the blanks because I deserve it because I'm in a good place. And it's a very subtle, subtle thing that can take place where we start thinking, self, I've been doing really good. So self, I've been working hard and I've been doing good things for the Lord. So you know what? I, I deserve a little bit of a reward for myself. So self, I'm going to, and you can fill in the blank. We have to be careful in such times when we, there's peace surrounding us and promises surrounding us and we're walking in a place where we're feeling, gosh, things are good. Beware, because things can go wrong. Proverbs warns us about this in Proverbs chapter 24, beginning with, with verse uh, 30. I went by the field of the lazy man. And by the vineyard of a man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns, and its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. So there can be a place where we can feel, and thank goodness that our walk isn't based on feelings, that we can find our place that, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. And we start lacking in things. Maybe we start stop reading, we stop praying, we just start allowing different things to get in here in our lives and we can find ourselves like this man here in Proverbs 24. So we see here in verse 1 that it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all of Solomon's desire which he wanted to do. You know what? This verse highlights something interesting here. It highlights uh, describing all Solomon's desire which he wanted to do. It, that's interesting because if you were to take the more literal translation in the Hebrew, it would literally read all the desire Solomon, which he delighted to do. Is our desire, guys, to delight the Lord in all that we do? Because we think of the word desire. And being men, our minds can go immediately to other things. It's a strong word that can be used to describe many, many things. In Scripture, we can see the word, this word is used specifically when you look at Genesis chapter 34, verse 8, and Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 11. It talks about having a desire for a woman or a man's longing for a woman. When you look at uh, the different verses in Deuteronomy, specifically in chapter 7 and 10, it describes God's love for his people, the word desire. When you look in Psalms 91, you would see that word desire is used for the human love for God. 
So we see that this word desire that Solomon is using here is a word in the Hebrew which has a different range of meanings, but it's a strong word that has a delighted, that can be also referenced as delighted. Solomon's desire and delight was to do God's will. When we look at chapter 3, and we look back at chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Therefore give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? Give me a heart of understanding to do God's will. You know, one of our prayers as men is asking the Lord that will you give your servant a heart of understanding? When you look at Psalm chapter 40, verse 8, it says, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law within my heart. When you look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 7 through 9, then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings, and offerings for sins you did not desire, no, had pleasure in them, which are offered according to your law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. God's will. When we, when we begin to do God's will in our lives, there is a delighting in our hearts. There is a desire that now becomes part of who we are. And Solomon is saying here that this, his desire was to do what he wanted to do, which was what? To please the Lord. And you know, as men today, we can want to please in different areas. It can be friendships, it can be our wives, it can even be doing a great job at work. But our desire is to please the Lord and to do the will of the Lord. You know, when you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, it's actually a commentary to chapter 9 of 1 Kings. It's interesting. So I'll be referencing both back and forth to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. But when you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11, it gives us a little bit of insight to verse 1 here. It says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and his own house. So we see that desire was something that came from the heart. Solomon's heart was to delight in the things of the Lord. You know, the sense is that the building work was at the heart of King Solomon. It, it was like, we, we can get a sense here from what we've read, that his heart was to build all that he's done for the Lord. But the buildings represent the kingdom that established peace and at rest and a promise. So it goes beyond just the building, but it, it's the temple of what it represented. This was more than the house of the Lord. It was the most central thing in Solomon's life. Why? Because of he was doing the will of the Lord. When you look at verse 2, it's interesting here. It says, the Lord, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. When you look at chapter 3, verse 5, you'll see that it's the first time where God has appeared to Solomon. It's interesting to point out that, Sol that God appeared to Solomon before the work and he appeared to him after the work was completed. We can see that God was in this whole thing. And we had seen that at the beginning of his reign, God appeared to him. The word Lord here, you notice it's capitalized. It's Yahweh, Jehovah God himself, that appeared to Solomon. Now, if we've ever had, I don't know if you guys have ever had any visions or anything like that, that that the Lord has appeared to you. But we see in Scripture that when Jehovah God has appeared to people, that there can be a sense of trembling. There was one, uh, and, and forgive me, guys, uh, wasn't it when he appeared to Joshua? And Joshua bowed low before him? Or we see the appearance of, of the Lord, which is actually Christ in his glory and revelation, and John said he fell as if dead. The presence of God. And it's interesting that 
the Lord appears to him and he responds and says, I have heard your prayer. What's interesting about this is that 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12 tells us that the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. Both in chapter 3 here in 1 Kings and in chapter, in chapter 7 of 2 Chronicles, you notice that the writer is not so much interested in what Solomon seen when the Lord appeared. Notice that there's no description here, like when John described the Lord when he's seen him in, in the book of Revelation. Remember there's a description of what John gives about the Lord? Or even when the Lord is sitting on the throne, you notice that John in the book of Revelation gives a detailed account of what he is trying to put into words. But here we see no description of that because the writer is more intentional of not what Solomon's seen, but what he heard. Look what it says here, that this here, it's that it said the Lord appeared. And it's interesting that the writer is now going to uh, indicate to us not so much a description of what Solomon's seen, but more of what Solomon heard from the Lord. Hearing from the Lord. We, we throw that around a lot, you guys, as Christianese. You know, I'm waiting to hear from the Lord. And, and it's, a, it's a legitimate thing. We do want to hear from the Lord. How do we hear from the Lord? How do we hear, right, his word? Coming to church. Coming to Tuesday morning especially. <laughs> when I'm not here. Who said amen to that? No burrito for you. <laughs> And we see here what Solomon hears is broken up into two sections here. From verses 3 to 5, we see that the Lord speaks to Solomon himself. And then in verses 6 through 9, God, the Lord's word have a more wider reference to the people of Israel. So let's see what he tells Solomon. And what I want to do here is spend a few moments breaking down verse 3. Because verse 3 is here is important because it's going to set everything else up for the remaining of the chapter here. But you look right off the bat. First, it says, The Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I don't want us to miss the wonder of all of this here. Solomon understood that it was no small thing to ask God, whom heaven and the highest heavens cannot contain, as Solomon declared in chapter 8, verse 27. He declared that. For this God to hear the prayer and hear the plea and supplication of a man like Solomon. That, I don't want us to miss that amazement. Because what does that tell us as men? That God hears our prayers. And we see, when you look back at, at verse 28 of chapter 8, you see here it says, Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today. And now we see that response by the Lord. Solomon dared to ask God because he knew that God's kindness and faithfulness towards, towards him, the son of David, and the promises that God had spoken to David when you look at verses Chapter 8, verses 23 to 26. What are the promises that God has made you? I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you pass through the waters, right? Isaiah 43, when you walk through the fire. See, these promises that we can bank on what God has given us is assurance that God hears our prayers. And we learned here unmistakably that King Solomon was a king whose prayers and supplication was heard by the Lord, his God. Do we have confidence, men, that when we go before the Lord, that he hears our prayers? Because we have a whisperer, right? All oh, your prayers. Who do you think you are? You think you can pray to the Lord? Look what you've done. Oh, man, the Lord doesn't even hear your prayers. You're jacked up. I mean, the onslaught's on and on and on and on, right? We hear that all the time. Or we pray, and I don't know about you guys being men in here. Maybe I shouldn't say this. 
but I'm going to. We start thinking of the dirtiest, ugliest, nastiest things. I mean, maybe you guys don't, but sometimes I do. And or, have you guys ever tried laying on your bed? I'm going to pray here to the Lord with the, you know, two or three pillows, your back up, your tires around midnight. How does that work out? Dear Jesus, thank you for, and the next thing you know, it's seven in the morning, right? <laughs> the distraction of our prayers. Okay, sorry guys. I think it's still going. Okay, that's weird. But the, the distraction, right? <laughs> 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 right? It was one of my many wives that is calling me. <laughs> Her name's Mizuno. <laughs> Callaway. <laughs> the distraction in our prayers, men. How easily we're distracted because we have a God that hears our prayers. We have a God that hears our pleas and our supplications and just read the book of Psalms and you see David's cry out to the Lord. His plea, Lord, hear my cause. Lord, I cry out to you. Lord, hear my prayer. And we see that the Lord is ear is inclined to our prayers. It's just, we have to pray, men. And we see that Solomon knew that his Lord, our God, would hear him. And we also enjoy the same blessing, men. This is what I like about Psalm 66, verses 17 to 20. It says, I cried out to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be the God, blessed be God, who has not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. What an amazing promise. We all know this one, Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. As believers, we have the blessed hope and assurance that God hears our prayers. But it's interesting to see here that in the second part of verse 3 is that not only did the Lord hear Solomon's supplication, he grants it. Look what it says in the second part of verse 3. It says, and your supplication that you have made before me. And what does it say, men? I have what? I have consecrated. I have set apart. I have made holy. I have made you a part of my kingdom. Solomon's prayer and supplication had been that God would hear the prayers uttered in the house that he had built. And the Lord's answer was that I have consecrated this house. The Lord has set it apart. He has made it holy. How has he made this house holy? Well, I'm glad you asked because you see that at the end here, in, the, in, the, in going in verse 3, it says, that I will put my name there forever. God's name. It's not just the word Lord. It's everything that he represents. That Jehovah God, the merciful, compassionate, forgiving, loving God. Everything that represents is his name. How many names do we have for the Lord? Just shout some of them out, you guys. I want to wake you guys up here for a second. Jehovah. Jehovah. Yahweh. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. I am. All of them. All of those you guys said are names that we refer to the Lord. Holy. Set apart. And the way that this house is consecrated is that God said, I will put my name there forever and perpetually. Continuously. Right? What's amazing about this, men? It's the same thing in our lives. See, God has called you, us men, to be holy, to be set apart. He has consecrated each and every one of us for his work. And he has put his name in you and in me. 
There's nothing more important than to have the Lord consecrate us, our temple, that he set us apart and made us holy. He says that he consecrated us by putting his name there forever. This is the most important thing other than the presence of the Lord being there is that the Lord put his name there forever and continuously. That's amazing. How many stamps of approval have we seen the Lord do this previously? And yet that same thing is for us, men. He has consecrated each and every one of us. But some of us can say, John, but you don't know my life. But God does. Our life, my life is just the same redundant old routine every day. Oh, you don't understand. I keep falling and slipping back. Well, get back up. What does it say that though a man falls seven times, what? He gets back up. We serve a God that's merciful and gracious. You know, we look at the architectural and lavish decoration that may have been impressive, but these were just mere things compared to the astonishing wonder that God has put his name there permanently. See, God has inscribed on your heart his name. What are we doing with it? His answer to Solomon is like, I have consecrated this house. You know, the Lord dwells in our, house, in our hearts. Therefore, we are set apart for him. We're consecrated to do his work. You know, when you look at Psalms chapter 4, verse 3, it says, But know that the Lord has set apart for himself who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2 says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And then all of us know uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, for I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live in faith, the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Lord has consecrated our lives, men. That's the wonderful thing. He has set us apart to do his work. And when we pray to the Lord, he hears us and he responds to us. But are we taking the time to pray? Are we then taking the time to respond? See, remember, we don't know the time frame. We can probably figure it out. But from the time that Solomon heard from the Lord in chapter early on in chapter 3, we don't know that we can probably figure out the time reference to now to chapter 9, but the Lord spoke to him. We don't know how long he prayed until he heard a response, but the Lord responds. And I think a lot of times we can say, Lord, I'm praying to you, and if we don't have a microwave answer from the Lord, we get frustrated and we give up. You know, when I first met Steve, uh, Steve was one of my and he still is a mentor for me as I started coming to church here. He's also Ray's and I's golf instructor. <laughs> He's all quack, right? When I came into Lion Tamers, I was strung out, right? And Steve kind of took me under his wing and uh, discipled me in a lot of ways. We would eat donuts and bakers all day long, huh? And he would pour into me. Um, I was, you know, shot out. But one of the things that, that I learned from Steve at that time was he would often say to me that I'm praying. How do he tell me? I'm praying. I'm praying for God's truth. And I think you prayed for that for quite some time. I don't know if you remember that. I'm praying for God's truth. And, you know, yes, we all know God's truth, but he wanted God's truth in his life. To show me, Lord. And what was fascinating about that is that the time that we were, and it was about a year to two years, he was still praying that. And that taught me something early on that God's not going to respond to me in two minutes. And I think what happens is, is that when we don't get an answer from the Lord, like right now, we, we, we become discouraged and we give up. 
You know, uh, hanging out with Jeff too, uh, things, some of the things that he's been sharing with, the, the length that he's been praying for certain things. And, and it teaches me, and all of you guys have kind of taught me this, that prayer sometimes response from the Lord isn't instant. But we live in a society that everything is instant, right? Why do we go through fast food? Because it's already there and it's going to tie us over until the next meal. Why do we have microwavable popcorn? Because we're not patient enough to put it in the kennel and let it pop, right? Why do we have those nasty frozen dinners? Because we don't have the time or want to wait to cook a good meal. So our society is always instant, instant, instant. And I think a lot of times we want Jesus to respond to us the same way. And a lot of times when we, he wants us to wait because he's teaching us something, we become discouraged and we begin, begin to turn our hearts away from the Lord. We have to be careful for this, guys, because God has consecrated us. And with such prayers, God takes our prayers with the utmost seriousness. Because if you think about Solomon's prayer, God responds to his and says, I have heard your prayer, I have consecrated this house, and I am going to put my name on that. That is serious stuff, guys. But God has called us in the same way. Are we taking it seriously? God, the house of Solomon that Solomon had built represented God's promise to never miss any word of prayer but in his name. But look what he says at the end of verse 3. It says, he says here, uh, to put my name there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, does God have physical eyes? Does he have a physical heart? Well, when you guys get to heaven, you can let me know. That's another study right there, you guys. But for the Lord himself to vouch in a sense to put his eyes there. What is some of the, the verses tell us about that he will guide us and lead us with his skillful eye? He is the Lord that neither sleeps nor slumbers. His watchful eye, his loving and caring eye. But an eye that may also watch to see if they're going to follow in their statute. So what can go wrong? Many things. But to have the Lord to put his stamp of his eyes and his heart on a thing that was built by hands tells us that the Lord hears our prayers. And it says, my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Forever and perpetually means all the days. It underlines the sense of fulfillment and permanence was an aspect of the promise when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 13, and then and verse 16, it says, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be established before you. Your throne shall be established forever. See, men, when we have a heart that is set apart and consecrated for the Lord, by the Lord, he will not only put his eyes and his heart in it, but his love and his mercy and his promises will be perpetual in our lives. We have a job to do, guys. What's interesting here is that God is now speaking to Solomon and he's saying, look, this is what I'm going to do because I have heard your prayers. And I think a lot of times, men, we can now say, okay, Lord, I'm going to kick back and I'm going to kick my feet up and I'm going to allow you to do what you're going to do. And this is sometimes where we miss it. Because God gives us a role that we must fulfill in order for this to happen. So let's look at verses, I want to read 4 to 7. But I want you guys to look at something here. Uh, because I want you guys to notice the little bit of interplay that the Lord is using that is instructing Solomon's role in all of this. And we can apply this in our lives because he's using, if you, conditional, then I will. Am I saying God's promises are conditional? No, his promises are yes and amen, right? 
But there's a role we must play, men, that I want us to point out here. It says now in verse 4, Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then, verse 5, I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. As I promised David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Look what it says in verse 6. But, remember the, the old butt bomb? There it is right there. But if you, but if you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, what I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will. Then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. That's heavy stuff right there, guys. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among the people. You see the if, you, then I? This is heavy-duty stuff. He says, I am going to put my name on this temple. Literally, I'm going to put my name in the people of Israel. I'm going to lead them. I'm going to consecrate them. I will perpetually be there. And now, it's the, now the Lord begins to instruct Solomon and how to, what he needs to do. And what's interesting is that how the Lord is bringing instruction to Solomon, that gives us a little insight. Again, there's an interplay of how the Lord instructs Solomon that can be applied to all of us here this morning. There can be this tendency for us to think that when the Lord instructs us, that it's one-sided. Okay, Lord, you're, I'm praying for a, and I don't know why this is a common thing among men. I mean, I did too. I was praying for a rib, but it was a, called a McRib from McDonald's. <laughs> Those are nasty. <laughs> but what's interesting, a lot of our prayers can be one-sided. A lot of our instruction from the Lord, we can say, okay, Lord, well, you've instructed me, so I'm just going to let you. But it's clear here that there's a role that we must take when serving the Lord. There can be at times that we leave it all to the Lord to work out. And yes, in reality, there it, we do need to put our trust and hope in the Lord. But a lot of times it can be a cop-out for us to not to do the work of the Lord. And we're clearly seeing here that the Lord is doing, if you will, if you, then I will. There's a role that we must play as men. There's a role that Solomon needs to do in obedience. Look what this says in verse four. The Lord says, if you, if you what? If you walk before me in integrity of heart and uprightness, and to do, does it say some of those I command you to do? What does it say there, men? All. all. To do all. So does that mean I can pick and choose what I want to do? No. It's not a smorgasbord where we can go up there and choose this and choose that. God's commanded us to do all. Well, John, that seems impossible. Well, that's why we put our hope and trust in Jesus Christ, right? You see that God has given a condition. Look. If you walk in my ways and you walk in uprightness of heart and integrity of your heart and do all that I've commanded you to do, then it says in verse 5, then I will establish. So there's a portion that we must do that Solomon has been instructed to do. Obedience to the Lord. What's that look like in practical terms? Well, it's walking before the Lord. Walking before the Lord, it's one of those things we can throw around, right? In Christian circles, yeah, I'm, I've been walking before the Lord, or we, we describe our relationship or how we live our lives with the word walk. You know, it's an interesting word in the Greek. It's actually a word that's broken up into two, where literally it means walk around. It's used some 96 times in the New Testament. Eight of those times are found in Ephesians. Six of them I like to point out. 
So the Lord says, if you walk before me, well, what does that look like? Well, if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, walk in good works. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, walk worthy. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, walk not as Gentiles. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, it's walk in love. 5, 8, in Ephesians, walk as children of the light. Ephesians 5.15 says, walk circumspectly or carefully. This is what walking before the Lord looks like. It's with the integrity of heart and uprightness. There is no secret formula, men. There's no hidden way of walking before the Lord. There is no six-step book you can go by and say six steps to walk in, in the Lord. It's straight out walking in uprightness and integrity of the heart. There is no secret formula. There's no sweet secret prayer room. There's no secret equation. It's walking with an upright heart in obedience to the Lord. We are either walking before the Lord men and doing all he has commanded to do in obedience or we're not. There's no middle ground. There's no half obedience, half faithfulness. Either we're obedient to the Lord or we're not. And the Lord says, and it, and it all comes down to our obedience to the Lord. When we are in obedience to the Lord, we are upright in heart. We're walking in integrity. We're walking before the Lord. See, God has said, if you will walk in my ways, then I will establish. See, men, there is a thing we must do. We must walk worthy. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. I like what it says here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat that on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. What happened to the other guy? that heard these words of, of Jesus and didn't do them. What was the great, what was the fall called at the end? And the fall was great. Obedience, men. But on the flip side, the Lord instructs obedience to Solomon. But on the flip side, the Lord gives a stern warning to those who are not work, walking in obedience Look how verse 6 begins. But he just gave the ways to walk before the Lord. Walk before me. Walk in the integrity of your heart. Walk in and do all the things I've commanded and pointed out to you. Do all of those things. But if you don't, look what it says in verse 6. But if you are your sons, I mean, wow, that's a heavy burden. What does that tell us that means? That we have to have our home in order. But if you or your sons at all turn away from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I've set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and this house which I have consecrated, I will cast out of my sight. Does that sound pretty easy and light? No. This is coming straight from the Lord's mouth. Again, we see the interplay, if you, then I. Clearly indicating that disobedience all begins with us. There is not because my parents didn't have their parents. It wasn't because I have daddy issues or mommy issues. Oh, it's not because my girlfriend left me in the fifth grade. It's not because my hamster died. It's not, it's disobedience begins where? It begins with us. And what's interesting here, we're going to see here in a little bit, that that blame can also, when the destruction comes because of our disobedience, a lot of times we're going to look here in verse 8 in a few minutes here, probably in about three hours. Why has the Lord done this? The Lord didn't do this. Their disobedience did. The choice is on us. Are we obedient or are we walking in disobedience? Again, there, guys, there's middle, no middle ground. And verse 6 comes straight from the Lord's mouth. 
If your son, if you or your sons turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, but go and serve other gods, look at verse 9. I'm jumping ahead, but look what verse 9 says. Because they will answer because they forsook the Lord. So you see that all what the Lord is saying here, it, the disobedience I just pointed out, all has to do is because in verse 9 it talks about they forsook the Lord. What does forsaking look like? It's to leave without intending to return. Forsaking. We see this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, where it says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. I've asked this before, and Pastor David has asked this before. Is Demas here this morning? Is there a Demas among us? I'm not looking at anybody. Have we allowed our hearts to be turned away from God, following other things? To turn away from the Lord means that we have forsaken him. And when we turn away from the Lord, it means that we have turned our eyes to something else. If our eyes aren't on the Lord, men, our eyes are somewhere else. And verses 7 through 9 gives us the result of disobedience. He says, I will, cast, I will cut off Israel and cast them out of my sight. In verse 7, it talks about that Israel become a proverb or a byword, which are, are related to sayings that describe reproach and it describes scorn and destruction. And in verse 8, it talks about when these people pass by, they will be astonished and they will hiss. What's hissing? You walk by and sss. Bruce always says, Jeff, sauce. Imagine sss. That's how astounding it will be. What's God warning them? So what can possibly go wrong? And you see that there's this reaction of the destruction that will take place that, the, that will, the Lord will destroy and people will walk by there looking astonished, amazed, and reacting like Sss. But we see a typical response of the world. Look at verse 8. The second part. Why has the Lord done thus to this and to his house? Typical response, blame the Lord. Blame the Lord for destruction. But we see here in verses 7 through 9 that there are three possibilities of disobedience that are described. There's the, the possibility of disobedience that Solomon is telling, uh, the Lord is warning them about, it's here described in three ways. Turning aside from following the Lord, not keeping his commandments, and going and serving other gods. In other words, they forsook, they embraced other gods, worship them, and serve them. And these are the three aspects of abandoning the life of obedience that God had required them to do. Men, make no mistake about this. The Lord will bring disaster on those he has blessed if they should abandon him. If they lay a hold and worship and serve other gods, see men, if our eyes aren't on Jesus, then our eyes are following and embracing and worshiping and serving other gods. See, this is a good reminder to keep my perspective and my eyes on the Lord. So what can possibly go wrong? Turning away from the Lord who has blessed them, the destruction of the Lord. The purpose of this warning was to prevent the disaster that would possibly go wrong for the nation of Israel, and eventually we'll see that disaster come. When you do look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, I just want to read here in closing. It says, If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer made in this place. For I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and ever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. And as if for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my commandments and my judgments, 
then I'll establish my throne forever. Men, what are our eyes on this morning? What are those things that may be leading us away from disobedience or leading us away from obedience? Let's be men that have a fierce obedience to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Next week, we'll finish up chapter 9. And, uh, and again, guys, again, uh, uh, Andy will be here selling tickets. If his tickets are a little bit, if you guys want to come to me, I'll sell them to you for a little bit cheaper. <laughs> but let's pray, guys. Father, thank you so much for this time that we had together, just looking at this portion of Scripture, Lord. And Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us instruction and, and Lord, in obedience to you. And you sternly warned Solomon of not only not a warning, but the promises that you give him that if you walk in, if they if he walked in your ways, that you would establish forever, your eyes and your heart will be perpetually on them. But we'll see sadly, Lord, later on that his heart was turned away. And so easily our hearts can be turned away too, Lord. May we be men that are focused on you. May we be men that have a fierce obedience for your name. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, thank you for watching online. God bless you. Oh, man.